Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. I told you it was going to be back and forth and this is a great book to do it with because it is extremely nonsensical and I know there are people, <coughs> Sasami-chan, who might want to make this into an interconnected universe and possibly even tie it back to the two men in bed time stories. I'll tell you right now, it's not going to work. But have fun trying. That's the whole point. That's why we have crack ships, ladies and gentlemen. And this is Bedtime Tales by Linda Jennings, illustrated by Hilda Offen. Man, do I love that cover. Which you're not seeing this time because we're now moving on to the first story in this section, which will also be the thumbnail. Percy's Journey. It was spring cleaning day, and Percy the cat knew that meant trouble. His favorite sunning spot disturbed the horrible vacuum cleaner roaring round his feet and wet soap suds flecking his orange fur. Percy decided to find somewhere quiet where he could curl up into a tight ball until it was all over. He walked outside the gate and saw the ideal place, a large armchair in the back of a truck. Percy trotted up the ramp, curled up on the cushion, and was soon fast asleep. When he woke, it was dark and the chair was shaking. The truck was moving very fast. Percy crouched down on the cushion, hoping it would stop. It did, and Percy suddenly saw daylight again. He dashed down the ramp and onto a completely strange sidewalk. Where was his green gate and the oak tree outside? I'm lost, thought Percy. Then he thought, Cat is never lost. Cat can always find his way home. So Percy twitched his tail, turned his nose northward, and started walking home. Two weeks later, when his little pads were worn sore and his stomach was empty, Percy suddenly saw his own green gate and his oak tree with a notice on it. It said, Lost, Orange Cat. I'll never mind spring cleaning day again, said Percy, curling up on his favorite sunning spot. Okay. That one at least had an arc to it. And now the real question is, is like, do I use this first image? Or the second image? Hmm. I'm thinking the first one, which is the cat going up the ramp. Just so you know the difference between the two images I was talking about. And now, top floor Tommy. Tommy lived near the top of a big apartment building. From his window, he could see right down to the playground at the bottom. There he could see some children, no bigger than toy soldiers, playing on the swings and the merry-go-rounds. There was one girl who looked really fun. She slid down the slide backward. She stood on her head and she threw a ball so high that it almost reached Tommy's window. Tommy wanted more than anything in the world to be that girl's friend, but his mom said he was too young to go out on his own. But I don't have any friends, said Tommy. It takes time, said Mom. Mom, Dad, and Tommy had only lived in the building for a month. They didn't know anybody. Tommy tried to make the children notice him. He banged on the window. He threw a plastic duck down into the playground. But the children didn't even look up. One Saturday afternoon, Tommy and Dad were watching football on television while Mom was out. When she came back, she had two visitors with her. We met on the bus, explained Mom. This is Mrs. Patterson, and this is Jeannie. Tommy grinned. Jeannie was the girl from the playground, and she was coming to play. Jeannie smiled at Tommy, and Tommy knew they were going to be the best of friends. I like how there's a lot of coincidences, and this happened. Well, it's reasonable to end up on the same bus as one of your neighbors eventually, because if you're both going home... And there's the tall building they live in, and Tommy is definitely on the top floor. There's curtains in a couple of the windows. Mm. Oh, you know, curtains blinds, framing, basically everything except these two at the bottom. No, wait, yeah, they're sitting in those two. Jack and the Beanstalk. Classic. There was once a boy called Jack who was sent to market to sell his mother's cow. When he returned, he gave his mother five beans instead of any money. I've been told that these will make our fortune, said Jack, but his mother was furious. She threw the beans out of the window and sent Jack to bed without his supper. When Jack woke up the next morning, he saw an enormous beanstalk towering high into the sky, through the clouds. Jack sprang out of bed, opened the window, and climbed up that beanstalk in a trice. 
when he poked his head through the clouds, he was amazed to discover a huge castle. This must be where my fortune lies, cried Jack, and he ran toward it. A frightened old lady opened the door. Go away, she cried. A giant lives here and he eats boys for breakfast. But Jack slipped into the room and hid himself carefully. Presently the giant appeared with a huge sack of gold coins. He started to count them, but soon dropped asleep. Jack sneaked out of his hiding place, swept the coins into the sack, and set off down the beanstalk again. When the giant awoke, he ran after Jack and started to climb down the beanstalk. As soon as Jack reached the bottom, he cut down the beanstalk, giant and all. The giant died, and Jack and his mother lived off the gold coins to the end of their days. That was a nice summary version of it, though I, I like the fact that they used the word thrice, I think it is. Yes. Which I think, in this context, means three days. It took him three days to climb that. I wonder, based on average human climbing speed, how high up that would be. Probably very high. Also, apparently it's okay to steal from people to make your fortune and then murder them after you rob them, if they're not human. Yeah, that's the usual thing in a lot of fairy tales. Aunt Mabel's hat. Aunt Mabel had a special hat. It was made from red and black velvet with a bunch of cherries on it. She was very proud of it. One day, Aunt Mabel took her nephew and niece to the zoo. Please wear your hat, said Timothy. And your coat to match, said Anne. They visited the lions and the monkeys, the bears and the parrots. They were just walking down the path toward the panda's cage when Aunt Mabel's hat suddenly lifted off her head. She looked up and saw it high in the air quite beyond her reach, in a giraffe's mouth. Aunt Mabel waved her umbrella. You naughty giraffe, she cried. Give me back my hat at once. And because the giraffe couldn't eat the cherries, he did. Um, okay. So, hat, zoo, giraffe. I don't think giraffes go after hats. I could be wrong. At least the giraffes I've encountered don't go after hats. So the whole thing is the cherries look so real the giraffe thought they were real. Animals rely on their noses more than their eyes most of the time. Also, he looks kind of funny. He who? He. The boy? Yeah. Well, the giraffe is also male. Notice he did. Ah, the giraffe looks fine. Except I noticed like the eyes in a lot of these animals are like the kind that will stare into your soul. I guess it's because giraffe's eyes are mostly black and deep brown that I guess they went with the little tiny pupils just mm -hmm. to make it easier to see that, you know, the giraffe is looking at the lady. Fairground fish. David won a fish at the fairground. He took it home in a plastic bag. It looked very unhappy. It had nowhere to swim. Mom put it in the sink, but David knew it couldn't stay there. Then Uncle Lynn came over to ask if David would help him clear out his shed. There was a lot of junk in it. Old bicycle tires, flower pots, a broken radio, and an aquarium. It needed a bit of paint on the rusty parts, but otherwise it was fine. Just right for my fairground fish, said David. Okay. Yes, that's a that's, story. That's it? That's it. That's it. This is like the storybook version of internet vines. Yeah, it's just, it's just there. And the picture was just the fish in the bag. He didn't look very happy. The face in the water. Wow, we put that story down to half a page? Wow. Once, long ago in Greece, there was a very beautiful and vain young man. One hot day, he sat down by a pool and gazed into its depths. He saw a handsome face looking up at him. Oh, how beautiful you are, he said to the face, and he could not drag himself away. He sat there all day and all night, and then the next day and night. He grew thin and pale, but still he sat there, gazing. At last the man grew so weak that he faded away altogether, and where he had sat, there grew a narcissus, a snow-white flower with a little golden face, which nodded and bobbed in the breeze to its reflection in the water. That is a very condensed story of narcissus. Nice mirroring effect on the drawing here. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I was just looking at it closely to see if they actually reused the image and flipped it, but I think it was actually redrawn especially for the time period. <laughs> Hedgehog brush. When Thomas let the cat out one dark and windy night, he noticed an old brush lying in the porch. Wouldn't it be on, not in? Hmm. 
Dad must have left it there after cleaning the car, he thought. He was just closing the door when Susan said, There's a funny noise out there. Sort of snuffly noise. Both children opened the door wide and peered out. Because that's what you should do on dark nights when you hear strange noises. Yeah, it's a story. Look at that old brush, cried Thomas. It moved. It's not a brush, silly, said Susan. It's a hedgehog. I bet it's hungry, said Thomas. Let's get it some bread and milk. And so they did. Yep. That's it. That's the end. And so they did. And so that's the end. Yes. Gotcha. Jean-Paul lived in a small village in France. Every morning, his mother would send him to the bakery to buy some crusty bread. French bread is very long and thin, like a stick. So Jean-Paul would tuck the bread under his arm and walk home with it, reading a comic book at the same time. Bonbon bon also lived in the village. Bonbon bon was a large and very greedy dog. One morning, he saw Jean-Paul coming home with his French bread, and Bonbon's mouth drooled. He padded slowly along behind the boy, and snap! He'd bitten off the end of the bread. Yummy! It was delicious. Another snap, and half the bread was gone. But Jean-Paul didn't notice. He had just reached the most exciting bit of the comic book where the aliens had landed. Crunch, crunch, that was very good, thought Bonbon. Bon. Just one more bit, and that still leaves a tiny piece for Jean-Paul to take home for breakfast. When Jean-Paul reached home, his mother was looking as fierce as the alien. Next time you go to the bakery, leave your comic book at home, she said. And Bon Bon may as well have the last piece, too. Pays for a dog to be naughty, thought Jean-Paul, but not a small boy. Okay, how did he... I don't care if you're reading a comic or not. If someone tugs on something you have, specifically underneath your arm, you would notice. You would think, but apparently he's a very unobservant little boy. A visit to the dentist. Oh, joy. Rashid had a broken tooth. It didn't hurt him too much at first, so he pretended nothing was wrong. He was frightened of going to the dentist. That night, he woke up crying with pain. Mom took him along to the dentist the very next day. Open up, said the dentist. Rashid felt a tiny pen prick, and then, wonderful, no more pain. Okay, smiled the dentist. We fixed your tooth. She gave Rashid a tube of pink striped toothpaste and a button with a happy smiling face on it, just like Rashid's. And once again, that was the end. I like the outfits and yes, he's smiling and hmm, that is uh, the shape of the toothpaste tube looks kind of interesting. The Balloon Race Griselda Goblin was taking little Jerry to a fair in Goblin Village. They each had six grubles to spend. Grubles is goblin money. We have a half-page story, and we have to take three words to come up with goblin money. First, Griselda took Jerry on the roller coaster. Then they had a try at the pitching booth. We've got two grubles left, said Griselda. What would you like to do? I'd like a balloon, said Jerry. Why, it's a balloon race, said Griselda, and the prize is ten grubles. Griselda bought a blue balloon and Jerry a yellow. They wrote their names on the balloons. Then they let go of them. The balloons went sailing up in the sky. Later that week, Jerry received a card. My balloon went the furthest, he said excitedly. Ten grubles would buy us each a ticket to Cockleshell Bay, said Griselda. We could have a day by the sea. And so they did. Does that happen a lot? Yeah, yeah. You notice it's happened at least twice in this installment. And... That's actually the picture that goes with this story. Yes. I thought it was just going to be a balloon. It's a full page spread just for this. For a half page story. Wow. That is interesting because those people are going to fly right off the top of the head of that giant millipede like creature. Much better face. Also, those don't look like is it goblins. Yes. Those don't look like goblins. They look more like elves or willow creatures. Willow as in the movie Willow. Or hobbits. Oh, that seems like a reasonable stopping place. This has been the second installment of Bedtime Tales by Linda Jennings, illustrated by Hilda Offen. Our whimsical travels through the series of random 
nonsensical, fully colored, completely illustrated stories for kids. Um, want a copy? We'll try to find you an Amazon link. Hey, I haven't mentioned Ebates in a while. It's, it's still a thing, and it still works. It, I mean, they even have an app. And since I mentioned both, you know, I have to do the usual disclaimer. Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content in the Lux Analysis channel. Thanks again for listening.